evening, good morning, and good day wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night so that we may be like a tree planted by stream water that gives its fruit in its season. So all that we do will prosper. This is week one of our 52-week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, Prophets, and Yeshua's words, reminding you that we are currently going through year one, which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion in Genesis. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, and the Hebrew-English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra-canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father, we pray for your guidance, for your wisdom, for your understanding, that your spirit may be with us, speaking to each heart and each mind out there. May they gain more wisdom. May they gain more insight of your words. May it come to life to them. May they research what we share and what we have to point out. And Father, we pray that your name is glorified and blessed in all that we do. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is a list of the main sources that we are using in today's study. We are starting year one, week one today. The readings for the portions are from Genesis 1 through 4, Prophets, Isaiah 1 through 4, and then Matthew 3 and 4. We are only going to do a deep dive on Genesis today. This is chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God caused there to be a separation between the light and between the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a vaulted dome in the midst of the waters, and let it cause a separation between the waters. So God made the vaulted dome, and he caused a separation between the waters which were under the vaulted dome, and between the waters which were over the vaulted dome. And it was so, and God called the vaulted dome heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning, a second day. And God said, Let the waters under heaven be gathered to one place, and let the dry ground appear. And it was so, and God called the dry ground earth, and he called the collection of the waters seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth produce green plants that will bear seed, fruit trees bearing fruit in which there is seed, according to its kind, on the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth green plants bearing seed according to its kind, and trees bearing fruit in which there was seed according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the vaulted dome of heaven to separate day from night, and let them be as signs and for appointed times, and for days and years. And they shall be as lights in the vaulted dome of heaven to give light on the earth. And it was so, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the smaller light to rule the night, and the stars. And God placed them in the vaulted dome of heaven to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly over the earth across the face of the vaulted dome of heaven. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kind, and every bird with wings according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kind, cattle and moving things, and wild animals according to their kind. And it was so. So God made wild animals according to their kind, and the cattle according to their kind, and every creeping thing of the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make humankind in our image and according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of heaven, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every moving thing that moves upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image, and the likeness of God he created him. Male and female he created them. 
And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of heaven, and over every animal that moves upon the earth. And God said, Look, I am giving to you every plant that bears seed which is on the face of the whole earth, and every kind of tree that bears fruit. They shall be yours as food, and to every kind of animal of the earth, and to every bird of heaven, and to everything that moves upon the earth in which there is life, I am giving every green plant as food. And it was so, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. Chapter 1. I'm going to review the creation account, the first six days. I'm going to compare the Genesis account to the Book of Jubilees account. As you recall, the Book of Jubilees was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls manuscripts. They actually found dozens of copies of the Book of Jubilee, both in Hebrew and Aramaic in the DSS. Let's start. Day one. On day one, God created heavens and earth. Earth was formless. The words in Hebrew are tohu vavohu. So the earth was formless and empty. That's tohu vavohu. And darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And God said, that, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and it caused there to be a separation between light and between darkness. And God called the light day, and darkness he called night. At the book, in the book of Jubilees, what you can see is that there are a few more things that God created, that he had created on day one. The heavens and the earth, that's the same the waters and all the spirits, angels, which serve before him. And then there is a detailed description of which angels, the angels of the face, the angels of holiness, the angels of the spirit of fire, and the angels of the spirit of storms, the angels of the winds, of the clouds, of darkness, of hail, of frost, of the angels of the abyss, abysses and of thunder and of the lightning and the angels of the winds of cold and of heat and the winter and the spring and the autumn and the summer and the angels of the spirits of all his works in the heaven on air and on the earth and in all the abysses and the angels of darkness of the darkness and the angels of the light and the dawn and the evening the abysses and the darkness and the light, dawn, and day, which he had prepared in the knowledge of his heart. And thereupon the angel saw his works and praised him and lauded before him on the account of his works. So in the book of Ju Jubilees, they summarize day one with seven great works. Heavens, earth, water, spirits which serve before him, abysses, darkness, and light. as compared to Genesis, in Genesis we have three great works, heavens, earth, light, God created on the first day. Genesis doesn't spe specify the creation of waters, the abysses, and darkness. And it basically it's presented as they are already there. And my question is, was darkness already there and the original light, not the luminaries, was created to light up the darkness? I don't know, but that's how it sounds, like darkness was already there in, in Genesis. Genesis also doesn't specify the creation of the heavenly spirits, the angels which serve before him, nor does it mention their praise on account of his work. So now let's look at Job 38. This is Yah's response to Job, and Yah is recounting the account of creation. Verse, I'm like mixing the verses based on what I'm seeing. So first of all, the earth. Where were you at my laying the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you possess understanding. Who determined its measurement? Yes, you do know. Or who stretched the measuring line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? Have you considered closely the earth's vast expense? 
declare it if you know all of it. Then verse 7, when the morning stars were singing together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And then the next four verses in regard to waters, or who shut the sea in with doors at its bursting when it went out of the womb, at my making the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling bend. And I bribed my rule for it, and I set the bars and doors. And I said, you shall come up to here, but you shall not go farther. And here it will set a boundary for your proud surging waves. And then the last four verses regarding light. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning? Have you made the dawn know its place? Where then is the way where the light dwells? And where then is its place? That you may take it to its territory and that you might discern the path to its home. Where then is the way where the light is dis distributed? Where he scatters the east wind upon the earth? The abysses, have you entered into the sea sources or have you walked around the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep shadow? And then the heavens and the spirits which serve before him, lots of verses here. Have you entered into the storehouses of the snow or have you seen the storehouses of the hell which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? And it goes on and on describing the, basically the different forces of weather and installation. So all of these are detailed by Yah in the book of Job as part of his creation. I find it interesting that in Job, it's lining up with what Jubilees. was said in Jubilees, yeah, yes. chapter one. Very interesting. Absolutely. Very yes. Catch. Yeah. Okay, I'm continuing. Day two. And God said, Let there be a vaulted dome. In Hebrew, it's rakia. And I personally prefer to call it firmament, but I like vaulted dome because it implies an enclosed system which I think that's where we are in an enclosed system. I'm not ready to argue the form, the shape of the system, but I really, I'm not sure that it's the shape that has been promoted to us in the last few centuries. So day two is completely devoted to creating the firmament. It's also called heaven, Shemaim. So according to Genesis, one great work on day two, and the word firmament appears only 15 times in the Tanakh, seven times in Genesis chapter one, five times in Ezekiel vision of the living creatures and glory of the throne of Yahweh, and three times in Psalms as praise for his creation. In the book of Jubilees, they also counted one great work on day two, the firmament. Psalms 19, one through six, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament, Harakia, proclaims the work of his hands. Every day they pour forth speech and every night they tell knowledge. There is no speech and there are no words. Their sound is inaudible. Yet in all the world, their line goes out and their words to the end of the world. In them he has pitched a tent for the sun and it the sun is like a bridegroom who comes out of his bridal chamber it is glad like a strong man to run its course course okay like orbit or a truck its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit again in hebrew it's more like course or cyclical truck to the other end of them, heavens. So from one end to one end of heaven, it's like a track, a cyclical track that they keep following. And nothing is hidden from it. Book of Enoch, section three, that's the book of the courses of the heavenly luminaries, chapter 72. I saw the treasuries of all the winds. I saw how he had furnished with them the whole creation and the firm foundations of the earth. And I saw the cornerstone 
throne of the earth. I saw the four winds which bear the firmament of the heaven. And I saw how the winds stretch out the vaults of heaven. And have their station between heaven and earth. These are the pillars of the heaven. I saw the winds of heaven which turn and bring the circumference of the sun and all the stars to their setting. I saw the winds on the earth carrying the clouds. I saw the path of the angels. I saw at the end of the air the firmament of the heaven above, and I proceeded and saw a place which burns day and night, where there are seven mountains of magnificent stones. Um, but the middle one reached to heaven like the throne of God of alabaster and the summit of the throne was of sapphire. And I saw a flaming fire and beyond these mountains is a region, the end of the great earth. There the heavens were completed. So the description by Enoch matches the description of the book of Jubilees. But Enoch, of course, adds a little bit more and really when you read the book of the courses of the heavenly luminaries it's very overwhelmed it really feels like earth is way more expensive and extensive than what we were led to believe okay day three so on day three let the water under heaven be gathered to one place and let and the dry ground appear the dry ground is called earth, and the collection of the water is called seas. Let the earth produce green plants that will bear seed, fruit trees bearing fruit in which there is seed according to its kind. Okay, and on Tuesday, God saw that it was good twice, so Tuesday is always considered a double good day. So according to Genesis 3, great works were created on day 3 dry land seas and seeds and i just want to point according to its kind and this is a major theme in yas creation in the mosaic covenant we saw many examples of the prohibition to mix different kinds in agriculture in clothing and even in animal labor this plays later into the story of the fallen angels who mixed not with their own kind, the daughters of men, and also corrupted all flesh, and according to Jubilees, the order or the blueprint of all flesh, via what I believe was genetic engineering. If I compare the tree to the book of Jubilees, here we have four great works instead of just three. God, on, according to Jubilees, God created the dry land, the seas, the seeds, and the Garden of Eden. Okay. And in the book of Jubilees, uh, chapter 4, 24, and on account of it, God brought the waters of the flood upon all the land of Eden, for there he was set as a sign and that he should testify against all the children of men that he should recount all the deeds of the generations until the day of judgment so basically the book of jubilees letter also reports that the garden of eden was covered by the flood water day four let there be lights really in hebrew it's not lights it's luminaries okay so there let there be luminaries in the vaulted dome of heaven to separate day from night let them be signs for feast and for days and for years uh, and then god made two great luminaries and here i'm quoting the hebrew the greater luminary and the smaller luminary to rule the night. So the greater luminary to rule the day, the smaller luminary to rule the night, as well as the stars. So on day four, according to Genesis, we have three great works, the greater luminary, the smaller luminary, and the stars. All luminaries are placed in the firmament and are to serve as a sign by which the religious calendar is supposed to be monitored and kept. So again, I'm saying religious because he's only talking about feasts and days and years. In the book of Jubilees, we also have three 
works that were created, sun, moon, and stars. But in the Book of Jubilees, they are saying a little bit more about the purpose. And here they are mentioning that they are supposed to serve as a guidance for religious calendar and for agricultural calendar. And you can tell this by the words that are used. So in the second bullet I say, and God appointed the sun to be a great sign on the earth for days and for Shabbat and for months and for feasts and for years and for Shabbat of years and for jubilees and for all seasons of the years. Notice that he is say, they are saying here that it's the sun that was supposed to be the sign by which the religious and the agricultural calendar are supposed to be monitored. Just the sun. They are not saying the moon, just the sun. I just thought it's interesting. Day five. On day five, we have three great works. Everything that moves in the waters, everything that flies over the earth, and all the great sea monsters okay and again everything according to its kind in my opinion that implies blueprint or genetic genetic blueprint in jubilees they are saying that first he created the sea monsters the great sea monsters they call them taninim in the deep in the depths of the water and they are saying, for these were the first things of flesh that were created by his hand. So basically, the first thing of flesh was the Taninim. Then we have the fish, everything that moves in the water, and the birds, all according to their kind. And then what else? So... There is again a special confirmation here that the sun fulfilled its role of prospering earth. In Job chapter 40, look behemoth, which I have made. This is what he tells Job. Look behemoth, which I have made just as I made you. It eats grass like the ox. Look, its strength is in its loins and its power in the muscles of its stomach. It keeps its tail straight like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are tightly wound. Its bones are tubes of copper. Its limbs like rods of iron. It is the first of God's actions. So Yah is confirming what the book of Jubilees is saying. It is the first of God's actions. The one who made him furnishes it with his sword. Under the lotus tree it lies in the hiding place of the reeds and in the marsh. Day 6. So on day 6 we have four great creations. We have the wild animals, the livestock, the reptiles and mankind. And here we have a complete agreement between Jubilees and, and Genesis as to what was created. The only thing is the Jubilees uh, is adding that, uh, that there are 22 kinds or I'm guessing 22 genetic types of, of flesh created on the fourth day and I'm not sure what are the other 21 exactly because we have so many types of animals so I don't know what they meant by the 22 which means 21 plus mankind. So my comments on Genesis, humankind is created to live and thrive on the land in general. They have two divine directives, be fruitful and multiply. That's the first directive that they received from Yah. And then they have dominion over all earthly creatures, dry land, airborne, and accurate. My comments on Jubilees, I wonder what are the 21 kinds? And also in Jubilees 4, 9, and 12, and after Adam had completed 40 days in the land where he had been created, so Adam was created somewhere on the land, on the dry land, 
we brought him into the Garden of Eden to till and keep it, but his wife they brought in on the 80th day, and after this she entered into the Garden of Eden. And when she had completed these 80 days, we brought her into the Garden of Eden, for it the garden is holier than all the earth besides, and every tree that is planted in it is holy. So here Jubilees is adding a few more details that Adam was brought into the garden 40 days after he was created and his wife was brought 40 days after Adam, 80 days basically after she was created. I have a comment on that. As you read that, I thought four kinds. He made on the fourth day wild animals, livestock, reptiles, and mankind. I was thinking, is it talking about 22 kinds of those four? The wild animals, livestock, reptiles, and mankind. Not meaning that each one of them is 22, just saying 22 in total with those four mentioned as the hierarchy. Or does the 22 stand for something else like DNA? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. It's, it stands for DNA. And I'm thinking if we put mankind as one kind, then we have one, two, three other types, 21. So seven types of each, maybe. I don't know. Okay. But it's really thought. interesting. Yeah. Okay, a few, just a, a few other thoughts to ponder about Genesis 1. So, verses 1 and 2, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty, tohu vavo, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Tohu Vavo is mentioned only in one more place in the Tanakh, in Jeremiah chapter 4, where he is describing an invasion from the north. And I would like for you at your spare time to compare chapter of Jeremiah chapter 4 to Joel chapter 2. You will, it, it will definitely start you on a rabbi trail. But anyway, in chapter 4, Jeremiah said, I looked at the earth, and behold, it was wasteland and emptiness, meaning tohu vavo, and to the heavens, and they were without their light. I looked at the mountains, and behold, they were quacking, quacking, and all of the hills were jolted to and fro. I look and behold, there was no person, and all of the birds of the sky had fled. I looked and behold, the fruitful land was a desert, and all of its cities were ruined before Yahweh, before the face of his burning anger. In the book of Jubilee, chapter 1, 29, And the angel of the face who went before the camp of Israel in the wilderness took the tables of the divisions of the years from the beginning of the creation of the seven-year cycles, and the jubilees according to the Torah and of the testimony year by year and to its count and the jubilees according to the years from the day of the new creation the day of the new creation when the heavens and the earth and all the powers of the heaven and all the creation of the earth were made until the sanctuary of Yah shall be made in Jerusalem on Mount Zion and all of the heavenly luminaries shall be renewed for sanctification, holiness, and for peace, and for blessing of all the elect of Israel to be so for all of eternity. Again, in Book of Jubilee 4.26, For God has four places on the earth, the Garden of Eden, the Mount of the East, and this mountain on which you are standing this day Mount Sinai and Mount Zion which will be sanctified in the new creation for a sanctification of the earth through it through Mount Zion will be there will the earth be sanctified from all its guilt and its uncleanliness throughout the generations of the world for eternity and then in the book of Enoch in the book of the courses of the heavenly luminaries chapter 72 the book of the courses of the luminaries of the heaven the relations of each according to their classes their dominion and their seasons according to their names and places of origin and according to their months which uriel the holy angel who was with me 
who is their guide showed me and he showed me all their laws exactly as they are and how it is with regard to all the years of the world and unto eternity till the new creation is accomplished which dureth till eternity so i read all of these because i have these questions in my mind is it possible that the creation account in genesis 1 is not the first creation is it possible that the earth being formless and empty tov avo implies that it was destroyed completely and then remade or recreated and not only that the earth was destroyed, but also that the firmament and all the heavenly luminaries. How can something be renewed if it didn't exist before? How can something be new if there wasn't something similar prior to it that was old? That's excellent. <laughs> okay, so we are jumping to chapter 2 now. Let's see chapter 2. And heaven and earth and all their array were finished. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because on it he rested from all his work of creating that there was to do. These are the generations of heaven and earth when they were created. In the day that Yahweh God made earth and heaven, before any plant of the field was on earth, and before any plant of the field had sprung up, because Yahweh God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no human being to cultivate the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground, when Yahweh God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature, and Yahweh God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man who he had formed. And Yahweh God caused to grow from the ground every tree that was pleasing to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, along with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out from Eden that watered the garden, and from there it diverged and became four branches. The name of the first is the Pishon. It went around all the land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the name of the second is Jehan. It went around all the land of Cush. And the name of the third is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And Yahweh God took the man and set him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. And Yahweh God commanded the man, saying, from every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. Then Yahweh God said, It is not good that the man is alone. I will make for him a helper as his counterpart. And out of the ground Yahweh God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky. And he brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called that living creature was its name. And the man gave names to every domesticated animal, and to the birds of heaven, and to all the wild animals. But for the man there was not found a helper as his counterpart. And Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. While he slept, he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh where it had been. And Yahweh God fashioned the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman, and brought her to the man. And the man said, She is now bone from my bones, and flesh from my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken from man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cling to his wife, and they shall be as one flesh. And the man and his wife, both of them, were naked, and they were not ashamed. I wanted to check on, yeah, I heard that there is a hypothesis that maybe Genesis 2 presents a different creation order than Genesis 1. So I just wanted to answer that question, if it is true. So the short answer is no, Genesis 2 does not present a different creation order than Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, all references are to Elohim. In Genesis 2, all references are to Yahweh Elohim. That's just a side comment. In fact, Genesis 2, 4, 4 is the first time we are introduced to the name Yahweh. Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, I consider it like the executive summary, so to say, of creation. Genesis 2 does not present a creation account at all, but presupposes the completion of God's work of creation as set forth in chapter 1. The first three verses of Genesis 2 simply carry the narrative of chapter, to chapter 1 to its final and logical conclusion, using the same vocabulary and style as employed in the previous chapter. 
it's set for the completion of the whole primal work of creation and the special sanctity conferred on the seventh day as a symbol and memorial of God's creative work. Verse 4 then sums up the whole sequence that has just been surveyed by saying, These are the generations of heavens and earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh God made earth and heaven. Having finished the overall survey of the subject, one important feature that has already been mentioned, the creation of man, then develops in detail. To quote Kenneth Kitchen, a British biblical scholar, Genesis 1 mentions the creation of man as the last of a series and without any details. Whereas in Genesis 2, man is the center of interest and more specific details are given about him and his setting. Failure to recognize the complementary nature of the subject distinction between a skeleton outline of all creation on the one hand and the concentration in detail on man and his immediate environment on the other border on obscure, I had to go and look in the dictionary what it means, deliberately presenting information in an abstruse and imprecise manner that limits further inquiry and understanding of the subject. So the structure of Genesis 2 stands in clear contrast to every creation account known to in comparative literature. It was never intended to be a creation account at all, except insofar as it relates the circumstances of man's creation as a child of God fashioned in his image, infused with his breath of life, and brought into an intimate personal relationship with Yahweh himself. Chapter 2 concerns itself with a description of the ideal setting that Yah meticulously prepared for Adam and Eve to begin their life in, walking in loving fellowship with him as responsible and obedient children. The language used here to describe Yah's action is, langu is a language ordinarily used to describe parents tenderly taking care of their beloved babies. That's how I look at it when I read the Hebrew words that are used. Quite clearly then, chapter 2 is built on the foundation of chapter 1 and represents no different tradition than the first chapter or discrepant account of the order of creation. And then the last comment that I want to make on this chapter is regarding the Garden of Eden. I put the two verses here from the Book of Jubilees regarding the Garden of Eden. And I went researching to see if there are any opinions as to where the Garden of Eden might have been located. And what I found is that actually there was a place called Eden in the Tanakh and it was mentioned in just a handful of a location, handful of locations. And I mentioned two of them here from Isaiah and Ezekiel where they are describing Eden. And apparently it, there was a place like this and if you look at the map on the right and look for a number, there is a small place, number one, Bit Adini. So Bit Adini is literally, it's in a Semitic language, it's Eden, basically House of Eden. So Assyrian records have revealed the identification of an Aramean, meaning from Aram. Aramean states that thrived between the 10th and 9th century BCE. The name of this kingdom was the House of Eden and its capital was centered at it's a place that is in modern day Syria. And I would like to suggest a possibility here that maybe this is where Eden was located originally but of course it was covered by the water of the flood and maybe there is a memory, a collective memory of it being more or less the location and that's why it was called the House of Eden. And I found it 
curious that Abraham was from that part of the world. He was an Aramean and his son Isaac and grandson Jacob married Aramean girls from Haran. So I just thought it's an interesting coincidence and I don't believe in coincidences that Abraham was from that part of the world. Yeah, I know I've read other places where, I can't remember where, and I, get, I didn't focus on the Garden of Eden, otherwise I would probably found this, but I re recall reading something about it being moved or transplanted in some form or fashion. That could have happened too, but I cannot remember where I read that. Okay. Okay, so next I'm going to start on a topic that is going to be a very interesting, could be controversial, but it's something that... When reading Genesis 2 and reading about Adam and Eve, it makes me think deeper into the whole creation. When Yah says, let's make man in our image, and that's plural. So I wanted to touch on Genesis 2.18, and it says, Then Yahweh God said, Is it not good that man is alone? I will make for him a helper, and that's Eve, a female, as his counterpart. So I wonder if Yahweh has a helper too. So let's see if Yahweh has a helper in some form or fashion Adam did. Do you realize that Adam and Eve neither were born or begotten? They were just created in an adult form with intelligence in speaking as adults, working the garden and other various duties. They had intelligence upon creation of them. Female came from the male, as we know, from man's rib, and some say the DNA in the rib, there's, it's very rich in DNA, etc. inside the rib, specifically. And versus spirit, Yah's mouth spoke life. We have woman coming out of man's rib, and then we have life coming out of Yah's mouth. Genesis 2, 21 through 22. Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. While he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh where it had been. And Yahweh God fashioned the rib which he had taken from man into woman and brought her to the man. Let's look at Yahweh and wisdom, how they may compare to that, or do they compare to that. We read in Sirach 24.3, and this is wisdom speaking, when it talks about wisdom. If you're not familiar with wisdom in Proverbs 8, many places in Proverbs, and throughout the, the Tanakh, you'll read about wisdom, and wisdom is used with characteristics given to wisdom, and it always refers to wisdom as her. So this is wisdom speaking in Sirach 24.3. I, wisdom, came out of the mouth of the Most High and covered the earth as a cloud. The wisdom was created fully active with Yah and helps Yah, similar to what we covered on Eve. And when did this happen? Proverbs 8.23. And this is wisdom speaking. From eternity, I was set up from the first, from the beginning of the earth. So it doesn't say she was born, but we do see from eternity she was set forth from Yah. She came out of his mouth at the beginning. And Sirach 24, 9, wisdom speaking, He, Yah, created me from the beginning before the world, and I shall never fail. Sirach 1, 4 through 5, wisdom hath been created before all things, and the understanding of prudence from everlasting. The word of God most high is the fountain of wisdom, and her ways are everlasting commandments. We see in the biblical hierarchy, the husband provides, protects, and loves his wife. The wife helps, comforts, teaches her husband and children. Let us continue. Genesis 1, verses 2. I'm going to talk about in the very beginning, before the ages. I would say this is before the earth was even created, Genesis 1. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Proverbs 8, 22 to 31, wisdom speaking. Yahweh possessed me, the first of his ways, before his acts of old. From eternity I was set up from the first, from the beginning of the earth. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no springs of abounding water, before mountains had been shaped, before hills I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields, or the first dust of the world, when he established the heavens, there I was, when he drew a circle upon the face of the deep, when he made skies from above, when he founded fountains of the deep, 
when he assigned his limits to the sea, that water shall not transgress his command. When he marked the foundations of the earth, I was beside him, a master workman. And I was delighting day by day, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in the world of his earth. And my delight was with the children of humankind. And in Strong 7069, Kana, to get a choir, that is defined as acquire, bought, possessed, purchased, redeemed. And in Genesis thirty-four twelve, ask of me a bride price and gift ever so high. And I give according to what you say to me, but give me the girl for a wife. So there's a price, a bride price that is being given for a wife. And Sirach 36, 24, he that gets a wife begins a possession a help like unto himself, and a pillar of rest. And we just read Proverbs 8.22, Yahweh possessed me. So in similar fashion, Yahweh has wisdom, similar to the physical, where a husband has a bride, and he possesses her as a possession, so to speak. I know the terminology of possession is quite controversial, I guess you'd say, in that sense, but it's something, as I just read deeper, that it's uh, acquire, bought, possessed, purchased, redeemed. This language is used because what the husband is going to do is he is going to be a covering for the wife in all forms and fashions because he has given something for her, to obtain her, to have her, and to then has to maintain, cover her for the rest of his life. And we can read about more about that with husbands and wives. But I want to skip to Sirach 24, 5, going back to the face of the deep in Proverbs 8. Sirach 24, 5, wisdom speaking again. I alone compassed the circuit of heaven and walked in the bottom of the deep. So that's confirming with uh, Proverbs. Psalms 136, 5, to him who made the heavens with skill, and this is referring to the master workman mentioned in Proverbs with wisdom, to him who made the heavens with skill, for his loyal love endures forever. Sirach 1, 8 through 10, there is one wise and greatly to be feared, the Lord, sitting upon his throne. He created her, and this is talking about wisdom, and saw her and numbered her and poured her out upon all his works. She is with all flesh according to his gift, and he has given her to them that love him. Sirach 24, 9, wisdom speaking. He created me from the beginning before the world, and I shall never fail. Who is wisdom? Is this just a term, or is there more to wisdom? Because she has similitude to the Ruach HaKodesh, is it the Ruach HaKodesh, or is it a similar spirit? You make that call. Acts 2, 17, and it will be in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and young men see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Proverbs 1, 20 through 23, wisdom calls out in the streets. In her square, she right raises her voice. On the busy corner, she cries out at the entrances of the gate in the city. She speaks her sayings. How long, O simple ones, will you love simplicity? How long will you scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools hate knowledge? May you turn to my argument. Behold, I shall pour out my spirit upon you. I will make my words known to you. This is very similar to the actions of the Ruach HaKodesh, and I guess a similar action to what a spirit can do, but the only two times I've seen this pouring out of a spirit mentioned is the Ruach HaKodesh and wisdom only. Luke 11, 49, for this reason also the wisdom of God said, I will send to them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. Acts 28, 25, so being in disagreement with one another, they began to leave after Paul made one statement. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through the prophet Isaiah to your fathers. So the similitude on the wisdoms of sending out prophets that's mentioned in Luke and the Holy Spirit spoke through prophets in Acts. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 through 8, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasiveness of wisdom, but with demonstration of the Spirit and power, in order that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now we do speak wisdom among the mature, but wisdom not of this age or of the rulers of this age who are perishing, but we speak the hidden wisdom of God in a mystery 
which God predestined before the ages, talk about wisdom, before the ages, for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And further in 1 Corinthians 12 to 13 there, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, in order that we may know the things freely given to us by God, things which we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in the words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. Once again, similitude of wisdom with the Ruach, and I'll let everyone make their decisions on what they think about that. I'm not going to go deep into that. I'm here mainly to talk about Genesis 2, where woman coming out of man, having a help meet, and that wisdom is, I think, the helper to Yah in his creation and his, in his works. And however you want to interpret what wisdom is up to you, but you obviously see as we read here the characteristics and giving wisdom a feminine description fits into that helper of Yah. Where can wisdom be found? Enoch 42, 1 through 2. Wisdom found no place where she might dwell. Then a dwelling place was assigned to her in the heavens. Wisdom went forth to make her dwelling among the children of men and found no dwelling place. Wisdom returned to her place and took her seat among the angels. Enoch 84, 3. For you have made and you rule all things, and nothing is too hard for you. Wisdom departs not from the place of your throne, nor turns away from your presence, and see and hear everything, and there is nothing hidden from you, for you see everything. We see wisdom departs not from the place of Yahweh's throne. Sirach 24.4, Wisdom. I dwell in high places, and my throne is in a cloudy pillar. Describing that she dwells in high places, which is on high in heavens, and she has a throne and is in a cloudy pillar. And we know that her throne is near the throne of Yahweh, according to Sirach. Sirach 24, 8. So the creator of all things gave me a commandment, and he that made me caused my tabernacle to rest and said, let your dwelling be in Jacob and your inheritance in Israel. Once again, this is alluding to only to rest in Israel. And we know that in the end, when we're given a new body, and the law written on our hearts, we have to be born again through the Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. So another similitude in that fashion. Enoch 91.10, And the righteous shall arise from their sleep, and wisdom shall rise and be given unto them. Once again, wisdom will be given unto them, like the Ruach HaKodesh is given to them. So I think in scriptures it, it alludes to this, but it doesn't outright say it. I'm trying to put together this description so that it may maybe shed light to some people that when they read about wisdom, how powerful obtaining wisdom is and why wisdom is part of the creation and what she does. Job 28, 20. Indeed, from where does wisdom come from? And 23. God understands its ways and he knows its place. God knows wisdom. Let's talk about her yoke in Sirach 51, 26 to 27. More characteristics. Put your neck under the yoke and let your soul receive instruction. She is hard at hand to find. Behold with your eyes how that I have but little labor and have gotten unto me much rest. He's talking about wisdom. Let your soul receive instruction, Torah, and she is hard to find, but she will give you little labor and much rest. What other characteristics we see out there that who has this rest is Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest of your souls, for my yoke is easy to carry and my burden is light. And this is Yeshua talking. Yeshua is talking about the spiritual things as wisdom, because wisdom is a spirit. Having faith, devoting yourself to the truth, to Yah, to Yeshua, and walking in faith, walking it out, the yoke is easy, because with Yeshua and with wisdom. Sirach 24, 18, 19, and 22 to 23. This is a wisdom speaking. I am the mother of fair love and fear and knowledge and the holy hope. I therefore, being eternal, am given to all my children which are named of him. And who are the children? It's Israel, it's his children. Come unto me, all you that be serious of me, and fill yourselves with my fruits. 
He that obeys me shall never be confounded, and they that work by me shall not do amiss. Here, wisdom's talking about fill yourselves with her fruit, and we've talked about the fruits of the Spirit, too. All right, all these things are the book of the covenant. This is verse 23. Of the Most High God, even the law which Moses commanded for an heritage unto the congregations of Jacob. So I believe here that all the things of the Book of the Covenant of the Most High is covering this. Part of what wisdom's instructions are is simply and plainly the covenant. Sirach 637, let your mind be upon the ordinances of the Lord and meditate continually in his commandments. He shall establish your heart and give you wisdom at your own desire. Proverbs 4, 11 through 13, in the way of wisdom, I have instructed you. I have led you in the path of uprightness. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered, and if you run, you will not stumble. Seize the instruction. Do not let it go. Guard her, for she is your life. Wisdom. What must we do to obtain her? Proverbs 8, 7 through 8. Wisdom speaking again in Proverbs. My mouth will utter truth and wickedness in an abomination to my lips. All sayings of my mouth are in righteousness. None of them are twisted and crooked. Sirach 1, 26-27, If thou desire wisdom, keep the commandments, and the Lord shall give her unto thee. For the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and instruction, and faith, and meekness are his delight. So what must we do to obtain her? Keep the commandments. That's one. Sirach 19, 20, The fear of the Lord is all wisdom, and in all wisdom is the performance of the law, and the knowledge of his omnipotence. Sirach 4, 11, 19. Wisdom exalts her children and lays hold of them that seek her. He that loves her loves life, and they that seek her early shall be filled with joy. He that holds her fast shall inherit glory, and wheresoever she enters, the Lord will bless. They that serve her shall minister to the Holy One, and them that love her the Lord does love. Whoso gives ear unto her shall judge the nations, and he that attends unto her shall dwell securely. If a man commits himself to her, he shall inherit her, and his generation shall hold her in possession. Now this is very important here. For at first she will walk with him by crooked ways, and bring fear and dread upon him, and torment him with her discipline, until she may trust his soul, and try him by her laws. Then she return the straight way unto him, and comfort him, and show him her secrets. But if he go wrong, she will forsake him and give him over to his own ruin. I think these two verses are very telling unto us coming to faith, possessing wisdom, and we are tried. We're always tested. And we see here, she tests each one of us to see if we are true, if we will remain true to the law, to Yah's ways. Very interesting. Sirach 6, 26-31, Come unto her with your whole heart, and keep her ways with all your power. Search and seek, and she shall be made unto you. And when you have hold of her, let her not go. For at the last you shall find her rest, and that shall be turned to your joy. Then shall her fetters be strong defense to you, her chains a robe of glory. For there is a golden ornament upon her, and her bands are purple lace. You shall put her on as a robe of honor, and shall put her about you as a crown of joy. So what does Proverbs 4, 6 through 9 say, speaking about wisdom? Do not forsake her, then she will guard you. Love her, and she will keep you. The beginning of wisdom. Get wisdom. That's the beginning. Get it. With all that is in your possession, gain insight. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. She will honor you. That's that robe of honor. If you embrace her, she will give you a garland for your head. She shall bestow a crown of glory, just as Sirach mentioned also. Further in James, and then I'll get into upon obtaining her. James 1, 5 through 6. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask for it. We just read in Proverbs, get her. We should ask for it from God, who gives to all without reservation, and it will be given to him. But let him ask for it in faith without any doubting. James 3, 17, 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, peaceful, gentle, obedient, full of mercy and good fruits, non-judgmental, without hypocrisy. 
and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace among those who make peace. So we see the fruit of wisdom here is what I see this as is describing similar to the fruits of the spirit. The pureness, peaceful, gentle, all of these actions that we are to operate in. And then we also read in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called sons of God. We covered that, I think it was last week. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. Lastly here with James 3.13, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by his good behavior his works with the humility of wisdom. And that ties back into James 3.17 when he's talking about these fruits here. Okay, so upon attaining her, let's read Proverbs 2.6. I'll go through these quickly. For Yahweh will give wisdom. Happy is the one who finds wisdom and one who obtains understanding. The start of wisdom is fear of Yahweh and the knowledge of the Holy One, insight. And to human beings he said, Look, the fear of the Lord is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So it's defining understanding and it's defining wisdom. Psalms 111.10 The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. All who do them have good understanding. Sirach 25.12 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of his love, and faith is the beginning of cleaving unto him. I found that interesting. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. And then in this particular one, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of his love. And then Sirach 43.33 For the Lord hath made all things, and to the godly he gives wisdom. And lastly, Enoch 5.8 And then there shall be bestowed upon the elect wisdom. And they shall all live, and never again sin, either through ungodliness or through pride. But they who are wise shall be humbled. So, rolling back to Genesis 2.18, God said, It is not good that man is alone. I will make for him a helper as his counterpart. So does Yahweh have a helper too? Proverbs 31.10 A woman, a wife of excellence, who will find? For her worth is far more precious than jewels or rubies, as many translations have it. Proverbs 8.11 For wisdom is better than jewels, rubies, and all desire shall not compare with her. Job 28.18, black corals and crystals will not be mentioned, and wisdom's price is more than red corals, or jewels, rubies, same word there. Proverbs 12.4, a capable wife is the crown of her husband, but one causing shame is rottenness to the bones. Proverbs 12.4, a woman wife of strength is crown of her master, husband, but like rottenness of his bones is she who brings shame. Sirach 1.18, the fear of the Lord is a crown of wisdom. So we see these comparisons of wisdom to a counterpart for man. So I'm not here saying that wisdom is the wife of Yahweh, but what I'm saying is wisdom is working in a similar fashion as the woman was created for man as a helper counterpart. That's as far as I can go with it because it doesn't say anything more than that. And then I want to also give some comparisons in honoring your father and mother and keep my Shabbat. It's on the how to love God side of the Ten Commandments, not never. So I look at the first five commandments is how to love God, and then the last five commandments is loving your neighbor. And honor your father and mother, I believe, is on how to love God. Leviticus 19.3, each of you must revere, that's fear, your mother and your father, and you must keep my Shabbats. I am Yahweh, your God. Proverbs 6, 20, 22, 21. My child, keep the commandments of your father, and do not disregard the instruction, and that word is Torah, of your mother. Bind them on your heart continually. Tie them upon your neck. Sirach 1.5 The word of Yah Most High is the fountain of wisdom, and her ways are an everlasting commandments. Sirach 24.18.19 I am the mother of fair love and fear and knowledge and holy hope. I therefore, being eternal, am given to all my children, which are named by him, come unto me. All ye that are desirous of me, and fill yourselves with my fruits. So I'm once again making comparison here to that wisdom is also involved in the commandments. Her everlasting commandments are in support, or should I say a second witness to Yah, that we are to keep these commandments in the form or fashion of obeying your father and mother in that sense, is how I frame this. Lastly, wisdom to ponder about. Psalms 51, 6 through 11. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you make me to know wisdom. 
Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and all my iniquities blot out. Create a clean heart for me, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. We just read here in Psalms, In your hidden parts you make me to know wisdom. And it's talking about, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I know to me they're connected, and however you want to take that, may you research that yourself. Lastly, to end this, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Now that all has been heard, here is the final conclusion. Fear God Yahweh and obey his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. I hope that was a blessing to you and gives you a little insight when you're reading about wisdom that she was from the beginning out of Yah's mouth and contributed in his works and has helped him in different forms and fashions and is only in the house of Israel, as I just read. So very interesting, and I'll let you contemplate on that and make your own decisions. This is chapter three. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal which Yahweh God had made. He said to the woman, did God indeed say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that on the day you both eat from it, then your eyes will be opened and you both shall be like gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, then she took from its fruit and she ate, and she gave it also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed together fig leaves, and they made for themselves coverings. Then they heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden at the windy time of day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. And Yahweh God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he replied, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I am naked, so I hid myself. Then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I forbade you to eat? And the man replied, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave to me from the tree, and I ate. Then Yahweh God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Then Yahweh God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you will be cursed more than any domesticated animal, and more than any wild animal. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put hostility between you and between the woman, and between your offspring and between her offspring. He will strike you on the head, and you will strike him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bear children, and to your husband shall be your desire, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you listened to the voice of your wife, and you ate from the tree from which I forbade you to eat, the ground shall be cursed on your account. In pain you shall eat from it all the days of your life and thorns and thistles shall sprout for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread, until you return to the ground. For from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And the man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all life. And Yahweh God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin, and he clothed them. And Yahweh God said, Look, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. What if he stretches out his hand and takes also from the tree of life and eats and lives forever? And Yahweh God set him out from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out and placed cherubim east of the garden of Eden and a flaming, turning sword to guard the way to the tree of life. I will start now with the tree of life. Location at the throne of Yah. And I will read here chapter 24. Chapter 24, From there I went to another place of the earth, and he showed me a mountain of fire which was flaming day and night. And I went in its direction and saw seven dignified mountains, all different, 
one from the other of precious and beautiful stones, and all dignified and splendid in respect to their visualization, and beautiful in respect to their facade, three in the direction of the east, one founded on the other, and three in the direction of the north, one upon the other, with deep and crooked ravines, each one of which is removed from the other. The seven mountains were situated in the midst of these ravines, and in respect to their heights all resembled the seat of a throng which is surrounded by fragrant trees. And among them, there was one tree such as I have never at all smelled. There was not a single one among those or other trees which is like it. Among all the fragrances, nothing could be so fragrant. Its leaves, its flowers, and its wood would never wither forever. Its fruit is beautiful and resembles the clustered fruits of a palm tree. At that moment, I said, this is a beautiful tree, beautiful to view, with leaves so handsome and blossoms so magnificent in appearance. Then Michael, one of the Kodesh and revered Malachim, he is their chief who was with me, responded to me. I'm going to touch on this briefly. The Tree of Life location is at the throne of Yah, and it's spoken about the throne of Yah is on the tallest mountain, the middle mountain, with three on each side, and it forms like a throne. It's really something that visually stands out. But what I wanted to point out is that the Tree of Life, its fruit, it says like a fruits of a palm tree. So the tree of life would have dates as its fruit. I just found that very interesting to mention that the fruit from the tree of life would be like dates. Chapter 25. And he said unto me, Enoch, what is it that you are asking me concerning the fragrance of this tree and you are so inquisitive about? At that moment I answered, saying, I am desirous of knowing everything, but specially about this thing. He answered, saying, This tall mountain which you saw whose summit resembles the throne of Yahweh is indeed his throne, on which the Kodesh and great sovereign ruler of majesty, the eternal king, will sit when he descends to visit the earth with goodness. And as for this fragrant tree, not a single human being has the authority to touch it until the great judgment. When he shall take vengeance on all and conclude everything forever, this is for the righteous and the chassid, and the elect will be presented with its fruit for life. He will plant it in the direction of the northeast, upon the Kodesh place in the direction of the house of Yahweh, the eternal king. Then they shall be glad and rejoice in gladness, and they shall enter into the Kodesh place. Its fragrance shall penetrate their bones. Long life will they live on earth, such as your fathers lived in their days. We see here that the tree of life is now at the throne of Yahweh, and at the tallest mountain where he resides, where his throne is, and the tree of life is also located there alongside with it now. But he does say that he will plant it. Yes. So, like, as above, so below. So he unplanted it, I'm guessing, and then he will replant it. Correct. After the yeah, he says he will. Judge. Yeah, specifically he says it will plant it in the direction northeast yeah. upon the holy place. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. going to be moved again. I wanted to read about the tree of life, choose the life, the light, and the law. And this is coming from the Testament of Levi in the Dead Sea Scrolls, chapter 18, verses 10 through 19, uh, 1. And he shall open the gates of paradise and shall remove the th threatening sword against Adam. And he shall give to the saints to eat from the tree of life. And the spirit of holiness shall be on them. And Belair shall be bound by him. And he shall give power to his children to tread upon the evil spirits. And we know Belair is more or less Satan, the enemy, the adversary. And the Lord shall rejoice in his children and be well pleased in his beloved ones forever. Then shall Abraham and Isaac and Jacob exult. And I will be glad and all the saints shall clothe themselves with joy. And now, my children, ye have heard all. Choose, therefore, for yourselves either the light or the darkness either the law of the Lord or the works of Belel. Sirach 1919, the knowledge of the commandments of the Lord is the doctrine of life. And they that do things that please him shall receive the fruit of the tree of immortality. Next I'll cover the tree of knowledge. Where is it located and what kind of fruit was on it? Enoch 32, three through six. And I came to the garden of righteousness and saw beyond those trees many other large ones growing there. They are fragrant, sweet, large ones with much elegance and splendor. And the tree of knowledge, of which one eats and knows great wisdom, was among them. It looked like the colors of the carob tree, its fruit like the very beautiful grape clusters. 
and the fragrance of this tree travels and reaches afar. And I said, this tree is beautiful and its appearance beautiful and pleasant. Then the holy angel Raphael, who was with me, responded to me and said, this very thing is the tree of knowledge from which your old father and aged mother, they who are your precursors, ate and came to know wisdom. And consequently their eyes were opened and they realized that they were naked and so they were expelled from the garden. Also read Enoch 31, 3 through 5 in regards to this same description. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, tying this in. But I say this, brothers, that flesh and blood is not able to inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruptibility. Luke 24, 39, Yeshua said to the disciples, Look at my hands and my feet, that I am I myself. Touch me and see. Because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. So we're talking about our incorruptible bodies, flesh and bone, but they have no blood in it. Continuing about this tree, Isaiah 63, 1-4. Who is this coming from Edom, from Bezorah, in bright red garments? Who is this honored in his garment, lying down in his great strength? It is I, speaking in justice, mighty to save. Why are your garments red, and your garments like he who tread in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and there was no man from the peoples with me. And I trod them in my anger, and I trampled them in my wrath, and I splattered their juice on my garments, and stained all my clothing. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my blood vengeance has come. So it's comparing treading in the wine press, which is known as the grapes that you tread in to squeeze out the juice. And he's comparing that with the blood that's stained on his clothing. Revelation 14, 19 to 20, And the angels swung his sickle into the earth, and the harvested the vine of the earth, and threw the grapes into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was stomped outside the city, and blood went out from the winepress up to the bridles of horses, about 1,600 stadia. So here's a direct comparison of grapes and blood. So were the grapes eaten from the tree of knowledge and good and evil a factor in giving the spirit beings, Adam and Eve, blood? Because we just talked about they were shaped like, they were like grape clusters. And we talk about grapes and resemblance of blood. So did the spirit beings, Adam and Eve, when they took of this fruit, did that fruit somehow contribute to them now having blood running through flesh and bones instead of maybe water or something. Just a thought. Life is in the blood, in the fallen state, but with it comes death. You shall surely die. It's a very interesting thought. Genesis 3, 7a. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They saw their flesh bodies, whereas before they were as spirit beings. Very interesting. So I'm going to go in details into a few of the verses here. So just reminding you a few weeks ago, we talked about how our eyes are very powerful. They are the wellspring of many of our misguidance and sins. Lust, gluttony, greed, envy are all related to the eyes. And they are related to knowledge acquisition too, but not wisdom. <laughs> There is a difference between knowledge and wisdom. As we can see in this week's Torah portion, Genesis 3, 5 through 6, For God knows that on the day you both eat from it, then your eyes will be opened, and you both shall be like gods, knowing good and evil. When the, when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight, actually in Hebrew it says last to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, but actually not wise, knowledgeable in Hebrew. Then she took from its fruit and she ate and she gave it also to her husband with her and he ate. Seeing is believing is not just an idiom. Man follows his eyes and believes. And there is a world of difference between man's vision and the vision of Yah who examines the kidneys and heart and reveals man's deepest secrets of the heart. 
this difference is illustrated none better than in 1 Samuel 16. There Yah tells Samuel, fill up your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the best among his sons. Once there, Samuel sees Eliab, Jesse's firstborn, and he exclaims triumphantly, Surely his anointed, anointed one is before Yahweh. Yah instantly reproaches him. Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God does not see what man sees. For a man looks on the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks on the heart. In our case, Eve follows her eyes, which led her to an irresistible desire to bite the forbidden fruit so she can become like God's. Genesis 3, 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed together fig leaves and they made for themselves covering. Once Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, their eyes are open indeed. However, instead of leading them to be like God, gods, they gained an awareness of their nakedness, leading them to seek a covering for their nakedness and ultimately running away from Yah. Bear with me a bit longer on this trail so I can complete this thought. Genesis 3, 9, 10, and 11. And Yahweh God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he replied, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I am naked, so I hid myself. Then he asked, Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I forbade you to eat? Trying to deceive Yah is an attempt to run away and hide from him. And running away and hiding from Yah is not possible. Psalm 139 describes the futility of running away from Yah. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, there you are. And if I make my bed in Sheol, look, there you are. If I lift up the wings of the dawn and I alight on the far side of the sea, even there your hand would lead me and your right hand would hold me fast. And if I should say, surely darkness will cover me and the light around me will be as night, even the darkness is not too dark for you and the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are alike for you. Indeed, you created my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. Escape is not possible because he is the creator of man, and man is like an open book before him. The prophet Amos expresses this clearly. I saw my Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the capital so that the thresholds will shake and shatter them on the heads of all of them and I will kill the rest of them with the sword. A fugitive belonging to them will not run away and a survivor belonging to them will not escape. If they dig into Sheol from there my hand will take them and even if they climb up to heaven from there I will bring them down and even if they hide themselves on top the top of Carmel from there I will search and will take them. And even if they hide from before my eyes at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the sea serpent and it will bite them. Jonah the prophet running away and hiding from Yah is also a chronicle of a foreknown failure. Jonah is attempting to escape the, to distant Toshish. He goes down to Jaffa, climbs a ship, goes down to the stern of the ship and falls asleep. But he will not find rest there either. Even when he is thrown to the sea, he will not have relief as Yah summons a fish to swallow him and vomit him back to land so he can resume his journey to fulfill his divine mission. Foreign clothing or costume and deception go hand in the Tanakh. See Genesis 38, 
first samuel first kings to name just a few this theme appears for the first time in our story here after adam and eve disobey yah's command they seek to cover their nakedness covering in foreign clothing and seeking concealment walk arm in arm the garment and the search for concealment therefore both indicate loss of integrity our story plays on the connection between four words in actuality only two if you follow the hebrew roots of these words deceitful cunning crafty in hebrew arum naked in hebrew arum it's basically the same word naked nakedness erom so this is one root describing deceitfulness but also nakedness garment article of clothing begged betray cheat deceive bagad pretty much the same word why hide if you have nothing to hide so the victim man is irresistibly lured by the naked snake to possess knowledge like the gods following his disobedient act he realizes he is naked exposed in his folly as he didn't become like gods as promised he then seeks to conceal his nakedness disobedience with foreign clothing deception futilely hoping that the almighty will be fooled by the covering and not notice his disobedience in other words the story in the garden involves man's desire to be like gods through gaining hidden knowledge which leads him on a downslope to lack of faith and disobedience followed by an attempt to disguise deceive escape and hide but Yah sees all and knows all. Verses 12 and 13, And the man replied, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave to me from the tree and I ate. Then Yahweh God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. Finger pointing all over. Adam is disrespectful to Yah, speaking to him like an equal, not the Almighty that he is. He def defiantly points a finger at Yah, telling him that the woman he, Yah, gave him caused him to be disobedient. No respect, no accountability, no contrition, no begging for forgiveness, no repentance. Eve follows suit. She speaks to Yah as her equal, not like the Almighty that he is. She casually points a finger at the snake, blaming him for her disobedience. No respect, no accountability, no contrition, no falling on her face begging for forgiveness, no repentance, none, zilch, nada. And by the way, have we read anywhere up to now about their gratitude to Yah for creating them and taking such good care of them? Nope. Genesis 3.17 And to Adam he said, Because you listened to the voice of your wife, as opposed to my voice, and you ate from the tree from which I forbade you to eat, the ground shall be cursed on your account. In pain you shall eat from it all the days of your life. Yah is playing alone with Adam's finger pointing, in essence telling him, any way you look at it, you were disobedient to me, and for this disobedience you will pay dearly. The curse here reminds me of the template of blessing and curse in Deuteronomy 28. You shall carry out much seed to the field, but you shall gather little produce. You shall plant vineyards and you shall dress them, but you shall not drink wine and you shall not gather grapes. There shall be olive tree, trees for you in all of your territory, but you shall not anoint yourself. The cricket shall take possession of all your trees and the fruit of your ground. 
So what do the snack, the story of the garden and the new age teachings have in common? Let's go back to what I said two slides ago. The story in the garden involves man's desire to be like God through ga gaining hidden knowledge and the downslope to lack of faith and disobedience that ultimately ensues from acting upon this desire. Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, the hidden things belong to Yahweh our God, but the revealed things belong to us to know and to our children forever. Humankind hasn't learned this lesson by any stretch of the imagination. The lure and pervasiveness of the New Age movement and teachings in our society today is a witness to my statement. The New Age movement is not a single organization. The term refers to a large number of autonomous groups and individuals. There are hundreds of groups and secular and religious leaders in North America that could be described as New Age. The New Thought Movement, Spiritualism, and the Theosophical Society first introduced New Age beliefs and practices to America in the 1800s. These ideologies gained popularity during the counterculture of the mid-60s and early 70s. The origin of New Age teaching, a hodgepodge of Buddhism, Hinduism, Yoga, Meditation, Tibetan Tantric Tradition, Kabbalah, Tarot, Numerology, Alchemy, Gnostic teaching, etc., can be traced to Gnosticism, a collection of religious ideas and systems that coalesced in the late 1st century AD. Gnosis in Greek means experiential knowledge. The seven tenets of the New Age movement are 1. Pantheism, God is all and all is God. 2. Monism, all is one. 3. You are God and must discover your divinity. 4. Good and evil do not exist, therefore there are no absolutes in morality. 5. Separate the historical person of Jesus from the Christ spirit or the Christ consciousness. 6. Reincarnation and karma, an endless cycle of death and rebirth to mend your karma. And 7. A new age of enlightenment and transformation is coming. So those of you who knew me for some time know that I ended up spending many years in the new age black hole and I consider myself a survivor <laughs> so I have a special passion about teaching people how new age beliefs are actually just a very beautifully dressed but if you peel the layers you get to the teaching of the snake so here what i want to do is i want to quickly go through the few verses that i just described in chapter three and i want to show you how in just few words and few verses basically you can unfold the entire new age teachings into the teaching of the snake so let's start New Age teachings hinge on a few fundamental truths across the board. Here is a short description of this truth and how they come to life through the snake's interaction with Eve. The deceiver has been at work since the very beginning. The first New Age truth. There is a mysterious or secret knowledge reserved for those with true understanding leading to the salvation of the soul. The goal is to free the spirit from its embodied prison and the only key to unlock the prison door is that mysterious knowledge. Snake teaching. The snake implied existence of a mysterious knowledge that only the gods possess. He also implied that it is the key to liberating man from the prison of being mere human to the state of being like God. Number two. Knowledge is power and truth can only be known through personal experience. 
Real Gnosis comes from the conscience experience of the truth of life, death, and all of the mysteries that surround us. Snake teaching. The snake implied how powerful this knowledge is. You both shall be like gods. He also implied that personal experience, i.e. eating the forbidden fruit, is the way to accessing this powerful knowledge. New Age Truth 3. There is no absolute right or wrong, good or bad. You have only been conditioned to believe something is wrong. There is no divine standard of human thought and behavior. Absolute, unrestrained freedom should reign with no restrictions and force and nothing declared of limits. Snake teaching. The snake most definitely implied that truth is not absolute. He planted a seed of da doubt in Yahweh's truth with one little word, surely. He also craftily promoted unrestrained freedom with no restrictions and nothing declared off limits, including the tree of life. New Age Truth number four, self-knowledge is the key to the knowledge of everything that exists. We can only acquire this kind of knowledge on our own, by our own efforts and in our own experience. Snake teaching. The snake implied that personal experience, eating the forbidden fruit, is the way to accessing both subjective and objective knowledge. I propose that he was right about subjective knowledge. See my comments about the awareness they developed of their nakedness. New Age Truth number five. The conscience a form of active awake, awakened perception, when awakened can perceive other dimensions. It is here that real gnosis begins to bloom in the mind and heart, revealing the truth to the soul. Snake teaching. The snake assured their eyes will be opened, quote-unquote, awareness, and then they will have access to divine dimensions. New Age truth number six. Gnosis is universal, which means that it is compatible with all religions and all mystical traditions, because in essence, they are all founded upon the science of Gnosis anyway. It does not matter what one believes or where one comes from. One can be devoutly religious or deeply independent, yet acquire the personal experience of that which exists beyond the physical senses. This truth is also related to another one stating all religious are, religions are expressions of the one true universal religion. Snake teaching. The snake never denied the existence or supremacy of Yahweh. What he did do is distorting Yahweh's instructions and planting a seed of doubt in the heart of men. New Age Truth number seven. We must stop assuming that we know anything for the one who is brave enough to face their own self-deception, i.e. believing in anything other than the seven tenets of New Agers, and embarks on the quest to acquire experiential self-knowledge. The reality of Gnosis is quick to be seen. Snake teaching. The snake dismissed the fear of breaking Yahweh's instructions as nonsense. You shall not surely die. Moreover, he implied that they shouldn't assume they understood the instructions in the first place. Did God indeed say? And God knows that on the date. Man's fear of the consequences of disobedience is just an illusion or self-deception. The snake also promised an immediate gnosis. On the day you both eat from it, then your eyes will be opened and you both shall be like God. New Age Truth number eight. 
we must open our hearts and minds and listen. And then with maturity and internal silence, i.e. meditation, we will be told from the inside what we must do in order to continue onward in our process to achieve self-realization. Snake teaching. Well, in her quest to achieve self-realization, Eve was lured by the snake's words and by her own eyes and ended up falling into disobedience as well as following false teachings. New Age Truth number 9. Everything that exists is one. All distinctions, including your sense of being distinct from everyone and everything else, are really illusions. Note, contrary to this truth, quote-unquote, our story clearly emphasizes the uniqueness and distinctiveness of the characters Yahweh, the snake, Adam and Eve. They all exist separately from each other. They are all unique and distinct. In fact, not only the characters are separate and distinct, there is also a hierarchy in creation as is abundantly apparent in these verses, as well as in the entire Bible. And Truth, uh, New Age Truth number 10, the end destination of Gnosis is arriving at genuine inner tranquility through which we reach the final understanding that we are all gods. Snake teaching, the ultimate promise of the snake, is indeed that man shall become like God. And here I quoted two famous quotes, the first one from Krishna, even if one is the most sinful of all sinners, one shall yet cross over the ocean of sin by the raft of self-knowledge alone. As the blazing fire reduces wood to ashes, similarly the fire of self-knowledge reduces all bonds of karma to ashes. And then a quote from the Oracle of Delphi, Know thyself and thou shalt know the universe and its gods. And I included a link to a nice article that expound on what I just explained and give you a little bit more tools, biblical tools to interact with New Age teachings and New Agers. And of course you can always send me private messages if you need advice, but I do have a lot of experience in that area, unfortunately. Here is what I think about when I see Christians falling for and incorporating the snake's teaching, New Age Gnosticism, into their faith and practices. 2 Timothy 2.13 if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Yah will never contradict his word. If what you think Yah has laid on your heart doesn't line up with Yah's word, he is not the source of what you are seeking to do. It must be consistent with the commands and principles found in the Bible, as well as the character and ways of Yah as described in his word. John 10, 4, 5, whenever he sends out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice and they will never follow a stranger but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. If we are not regularly spending time with Yah in his word, we better not trust our perceptions of what we think he has laid on our hearts. Yeshua said his sheep know his voice so well that they can differentiate his voice from others. How are we going to get to know his voice above all, including our own, if we do not spend time with him in his word? Hebrews 5.14 But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have trained their faculties for the distinguishing of both good and evil. 
Discernment comes through the constant use of Yah's word, chewing on the meat of what we read. A casual and inconsistent approach to Yah's word that stays on the surface will not bring the spiritual maturity needed to differentiate between what Yah has laid on our hearts and what our own feelings, desires, or thought processes dictate. This is chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve's wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and she said, I have given birth to a man with the help of Yahweh. Then she bore his brother Abel, and Abel became a keeper of sheep, and Cain became a tiller of the ground. And in the course of time Cain brought an offering from the fruit of the ground to Yahweh, and Abel also brought an offering from the choicest firstlings of his flock. And Yahweh looked with favor to Abel and to his offering, but to Cain and to his offering he did not look with favor. And Cain became very angry, and his face fell. And Yahweh said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will I not accept you? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Then Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out into the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then Yahweh said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive the blood of your brother from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a wanderer and a fugitive on the earth. And Cain said to Yahweh, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Look, you have driven me out today from the face of the ground, and from your face I must hide. I will be a wanderer and a fugitive on the earth, and it will happen that whoever finds me will kill me. Then Yahweh said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain will be avenged sevenfold. Then Yahweh put a sign on Cain so that whoever found him would not kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh, and he settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And when he built a city, he named the city after his son, Enoch. And to Enoch was born Erad, and Erad fathered Mehuel, and Mehuel fathered Methashel, and Methashel fathered Lamech. And Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the first was Adah, and the name of the second was Zillah. And Adah gave birth to Jamal. He was the father of those who live in tents and those who have livestock. And the name of his brother was Jubal. He was the father of all who play string instruments and wind instruments. Then Zillah also gave birth to Tubal-Cain, who forged all kinds of tools of bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Then Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, Listen to my voice, O wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech will be avenged seventy and seven times. Then Adam knew his wife again, and she gave birth to a son. And she called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed to me another child in the place of Abel because Cain killed him. And as for Seth, he also fathered a son, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, he began to call on the name of Yahweh. In the book of Jubilees, Adam and Eve, their children, during the second Jubilee, the third week of that second Jubilee is when they actually had Cain, is what the book of Jubilee says. And then in that fourth week, and this is weeks of years, so the fourth week, whether it's sometime within seven years later or less, you had Abel born. And then in the fifth week, Awan was born, their sister. And then we see it's the third jubilee, so it's like, what, 50 years later, Seth is born. And then his sister, Azur, is born in the sixth week, right within the next seven years of that. Those are the ones that are mentioned by name in, in the Book of Jubilees, and then it also says that they also had nine sons besides them. So you had f basically four and nine, and we know that Abel was killed, so you had the four and the nine. And then Cain and Awan, they had their first child in the third Jubilee of the seventh week, and Seth and Azur have their child in the fifth, fifth Jubilee on the fifth week. So that's what I pulled out of Jubilees, just to give you an idea of the timeline and the children of Adam and Eve. I'll try to do this as quickly as I can. So I have reflections on Cain and Abel. Verse 1 and 2, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and she said, I have given birth to... And she uses the word in Hebrew, acquired or purchased. That's literally, that's what it means. 
a man with the help or actually through Yahweh. And then in verse 2, she said, then she, it says, then she bore and she continued to bear his brother Abel. And Abel became a shepherd of sheep and Cain was a tiller of the crown. The story begins with the birth of Cain and Abel. You can read these verses without much attention, but this is really a peak moment, the pinnacle of creation. Cain's birth is the first birth in human history. Man creates man. This can be seen as the realization of man's destiny to procreate and multiply and fill the earth. Pay attention to Cain's name. Actually, pay attention to all the nuances and all the seemingly missing information in this story. She conceived and bore Cain. Usually in the Bible, first a child is born and then he is named. But Cain was born Cain. He was born with his name, with his essence is folded neatly into his name. Cain, from the root Cana, meaning to buy, to acquire, to purchase. I also see a possibility for the root Canaan, meaning the, to nest, and a relationship to the word kina, meaning lamentation. But I'll circle back to it later. Cain's name defines his view of the world. The world is property. It belongs to him. Cain is the realization of Adam and Eve's life course. And from this, he sees himself as the center of the world and the whole world is his property. The whole world is his. He has no room for others, no room for a brother, and no room for the creator. He is the world. Cain's view is contrary to the basic trend we see in the previous chapters. Man should see his existence in the world as a grace and make an effort to be worthy of his existence. Cain ignores the grace that brought him into the world and his existence is seen in his eyes as a self-evident right. In our modern day and age, we would refer to it as a sense of entitlement. Therefore, for him, there is no need for any moral effort. He doesn't have to buy his soul. He who sees himself as both sins with the sin of pride. Abel's spirit, on the other end, is worded differently, and she continued, added, to bear. The word used here is added, as if to tell us that there was already one son in the world, and in fact there was no need for another son. Cain is the main thing, and Abel is the addition. He came into the world as Cain's brother. Abel is called his brother, even before his first name is mentioned. Abel is then less central, secondary, unnecessary. His name, Hevel, literally means foolishness, nonsense, absurdity, vanity. Sixty-six times this word appears in the Tanakh, and each time it refers to nonsense and vanity. Solomon devotes the better part of Ecclesiastic to describing this concept and mention it in name no less than 30 times. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Abel's name can also mean steam or vapor, a faintly visible gas, gaseous state of a substance. What a way to name your second child. Not only he is merely an addition, he hardly even take up space. The questions that are back to be asked here are, why was he born? What, what, what is missing in the world without him? What is his right to exist? Compared to Cain, who was born into a world waiting only for him, Abel was born into a world that already has someone in it. So Abel comes to a world where there is another and he has to deal with him. When there is already a person in the world, morality is required.
The resulting situation is not symmetrical. In front of each of the prader is another prader, but the existence of one prader is clear to both him and his prader, while a question hovers around the existence of the other prader, both in his prader's consciousness and in his own. The difference between the two is expressed in their professions, a tiller of the land versus a shepherd of sheep. The language of the verse tells all, and Cain was compared to, and Abel became. So we, we see solid stability versus movement. Cain is a man of stability, a man of assets, a man of the physical realm. Abel, on the other hand, is a man of fluidity, a man of the non-physical realm. Cain has land. He has a place. Abel has no hold on the land. He is fluid like the wind. He does not have one place. He wanders with his sheep, Abel's basic condition is the one that Ken would later consider an unbearable punishment, roaming and wandering. <laughs> Genesis 4, 3 and 5 And in the course of time, Ken brought an offering from the fruit of the ground to Yahweh. And Abel also brought an offering from the choicest firstling of his flock. And Yahweh looked with favor to Abel and to his offering. But to Cain and to his offering he did not look with favor, and Cain became very angry and his face fell. The question at hand is whether Abel is merely an unnecessary addition, and if so, is he in constant danger of life, or does the owner of this world, namely Cain, understand the special unique role of Abel in Cain's world? This question is the question that has been asked since then in every generation. Is there a place for others in the world of those who see themselves as the owners of this world? In Jewish thought, this question reaches its climax in the relationship between the nations of the world who see themselves as the owners of the world and Israel. Cain and Abel have a choice. They have free will. Abel can be vain and foolish, or he can be an inspiring presence. Cain can be selfish, controlling, and jealous, or provide a nest, a stable protection and stability to those around him. It is in their hands to choose what meaning to give to their identity. Will Ken remain in the consciousness of materialism and property or choose to provide a stable nest for his brothers? And will Abel remain a spirit without a real place, a spirit that is moved by the currents of the world or choose to develop into the spirit that moves the world instead? Cain and Abel bring sacrifices. Cain from the fruit of his land and Abel from the first fruits of his sheep. The contrast between them is not immediately noticeable in the text. They both brought offerings, and Cain took the initiative first, did he not? However, the language of the verses should be observed more closely. First, Cain is the initiator of the sacrifice, while Abel joins in later and also brings a sacrifice. A closer look at the words in the course of time reveals something interesting. In Hebrew, the verse says, at the end of days. This casual description of time describes a period of a whole year. So Cain takes his grain for himself, and only at the end of days, that is, at the end of the year, does he bring an offering to Yah from what is left. 
and Abel brings an offering to Yah, the first fruits of his sheep. This is not just a description of time, but also a description of quality. Cain brings from the leftovers left at the end, and Abel brings from the first produce. Each sacrifice reflects the consciousness of the one who brings it. Cain perceives himself first, and the other, in this case, Yah, last. And Abel considers the other first and himself last. Sacrifices of the type of Cain's offering were later in history common am among pagans. For them, the sacrifice was a means to an end so that they did not give their gods the best. Abel's offering was an end in itself. Verses 6 and 7, And Yahweh said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will I not accept you? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. But you must troll over it. Yah speaks to Cain, but this did not have to happen. There was also another possibility, that Cain and Abel would talk to each other. This was the obvious possibility, because it finally turns out that Abel has something that Cain does not have. Until now, Cain has seen Abel as an unnecessary addition to his world. But now it's clear that his brother is noticed and acknowledged. By Yah, Cain should talk to Abel and understand what is unique about his offering that caused it to be accepted. And Abel should also take advantage of this opportunity and share his thoughts with Cain. But both are silent, and Yah has to speak with Cain, who is feeling a complete failure. The Almighty makes it clear to Cain, your fate is not decided. At any stage you can correct it. History is not a rolling snowball, but a series of exit stations. You have the power to change the course of your life by doing the right thing. Being obedient and controlling his innate inclination to sin. Mm. Between Yah's speech and the murder, there is a verse that all the commentators have struggled with. And Cain said to Abel his brother. Many commentaries try to explain what Cain said to Abel. It's clear a dialogue began. Cain speaks. He makes an effort on his part. And Abel has the opportunity to answer him. But he doesn't answer. He remains silent and again misses the opportunity to be present and project onto Cain. Since the dialogue did not materialize, Abel becomes vapor. Cain becomes the first recorded murderer, and humanity has missed the opportunity to live together and serve Yah in harmony. So let's finish with the variant tickers. So as you can see, the book of Genesis even though quite a few, I forgot how many, but maybe around 20 manuscripts were heard in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were highly fragmented. So when we went through the reading, you probably saw that many verses were missing. Still, I compared and the few verses that were found, there was only one highly significant variant to the Masoretic text. And then I compared the DSS to LXS, there were way more variants, and then the LXX to the Masoretic, again, we had a few variants, and you can go back and read and look at those variants and let us know if you have any questions or any thoughts about them. We're done reading the four chapters and sharing our insights to each one of those. We want to open up the floor for any comments, any thought from these four chapters. Thank you for watching and may Yah bless you.